Good morning. Our scripture focus this morning is Luke 12, 13 to 21. Actually, I think it's 13 to 34. So if you will grab that pew Bible in front of you, in case you don't have uh, your Bible with you today, there's many Bibles spread throughout the auditorium. And if you're, you have your Bible but your neighbor doesn't, help them out, grab that Bible underneath, and uh, you can turn to page 57 in the Pew Bible. We're reading from Luke 12, 13 to 34. <clears throat> Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance of an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life's span? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the, glass in the, the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has gladly chosen to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts, which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near, nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Amy. Our Lord warns us there in verse 15, beware, be on guard. You see how he cautions us? Beware, be on guard against every form of greed. Greed is very subtle. It slips into my heart and into yours, and uh, our heart has a tendency towards greed. If you didn't get the outline, hold up your hand, and we'll hand you one. And we want to help you with this challenge because the Lord said, beware, be on guard. And, uh, and then he told a parable. I told you last week, our Lord was a master teacher, and whenever he uh, taught, he told stories, and we call them parables. Parables are earthly stories with heavenly truths. And he told a parable, a parable about a man here, beginning in verse 16. And uh, this man prospered and uh, did very well, but the Lord called him a fool. The Lord called him a fool. Why did he call him a fool? Did he get this idea to call him a fool from the man himself? I doubt it. I'm sure this man was very confident, very self-assured. Uh, you wouldn't walk away from this man and think he was a fool. And uh, I doubt he got the idea from the man's neighbors. I'm sure his neighbors uh, admired him, maybe even envied him. <laughs> this man's very successful. So where did he get the idea to call this man a fool? Oh, I know. Maybe it was because the man is wealthy. He's a rich man. The Bible condemns rich people, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> 
Well, Abraham was very wealthy, and the Lord used him. Uh, Job was very wealthy. The Lord used him. David was wealthy. Solomon was so wealthy that uh, people today have studied the gold that Solomon had that the Bible says that he had. And he wasn't a billionaire. Uh, many people have concluded he was a trillionaire. And, uh, and, uh, and so Abraham, Job, David, Solomon, Carl, a lot of wealthy people. God uses them. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in and see if you were awake. Uh, is God against wealth? No, he's not against wealth. That's not it. Uh, money is neither evil nor good. It's what we do with it. So why did God call this man a fool? Maybe it's because he accumulated his money dishonestly. No, that isn't what it says. Uh, he didn't do that. This man was a fool because he was a practical atheist. He was a practical atheist. That's why the Lord called him a fool. He lived as if there was no God. Was he really just an outspoken atheist? Probably not. Probably went to the synagogue every week. Uh, well, how do we have this idea that he was a practical atheist? Because we get to listen to this man think. We get to listen to his thoughts. You know, you can't do that. You, don't, you, can't, you can't look into the heart of another person. But God can. And God tells us what this man thought. And uh, it's verse 17. Look at it. And he began reasoning to himself. Here's the man thinking. We get to hear him think. Look at this. What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So there's his thinking. Listen to him think. Psalm four, uh, 14 says uh, that if a man says there's no God, he's a fool. And uh, this man doesn't declare that. But God is not in his thinking. God is not in his thoughts. There's no thought of God as you hear him, this man think. Proverbs 23 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. You know, we may put on a good front, but we really are what we think, God says. Um, now we see this man for who he really is. His God is, this, is himself. His life is all about him. Because he was a practical atheist, we see four things in his life that I want to give you very quickly. He has, first of all, no sense of divine ownership. Because he's a practical atheist, he has no sense of divine ownership. He thinks because he possesses a farm, he owns a farm. In those three verses that we read where Jesus gives us his thinking, he says, I, my, mine, 11 times. It is the grammar of an atheist. He never mentions God. Psalm 24 tells us that the earth is the Lord's and all it contains and in Psalm 50, we read that the cattle on a thousand hills are his. Every beast of the forest is mine. Do you think about that sometimes? I think about that a lot. When I go out to run, I always tell the Lord, Now, Lord, I know the deer are yours, and the turkeys are yours, and the pheasants are yours. If you could let me see a few of them, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I do. I tell him that. And then when he lets me see some, I say, thank you, Lord. I like seeing your creation. That's awesome. You know, it's fun. Plus, it breaks up the boring miles, you know. And uh, 
Psalm 89 tells us, the heavens are yours, the earth is yours, the world and all it contains because you founded them. It's all God's. It's all God's. And uh, this man forgot that. He had no sense of divine ownership. This is where... This is where being a good manager for God comes in. I know I say my house. I know I say my car. I know I say my wife, my kids, whatever. It's all God's. You know that? It's all God's. And I must remind myself that I, God has just put it into my hands to manage for him for a while. That's all. My house is 100 years old. <laughs> I've lived in it about a quarter of a century Somebody lived in it before me, and somebody will live in it after me, you know, unless Jesus comes first. He had no sense of divine ownership. Number two, he had no sense of gratitude. This man prospered. Why did he prosper? Well, verse 16 tells us the land of a rich man was very productive. We live in that kind of an area of the, of the world. Black soil, very productive. Never forget one time we were planting some uh, bushes around my garage. My, father, my father-in-law was here. And uh, he's gone home to heaven now. But he was here helping me. And we were planting these bushes. And he was always just sort of teasing. And he said, boy, this soil's terrible. You know. And he was actually being cynical. It, it was it was. Rich black soil, you know, and uh, not like that red dirt they have in Oklahoma, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, this man's soil was good, and uh, the crops were abundant, and God gave the rain, and God gave the sunshine so the seed might germinate, and a great crop came. And this man prospered, and he said, what should I do? Oh, I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger barns, and I'll say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. And... Uh, for many years, he forgot where it came from. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget none of his benefits. God has blessed us mightily, and it is very easy for me and you to forget that. The very air I'm breathing now, I got from God. Yes, the very eyes you're looking through now, you got from God. Very ears you're listening to, I hope you're listening, you got from God. You know, this man had no sense of gratitude. Number three, he had no sense of obligation. He didn't feel obligated to anybody. It was all about him. When he prospered, it was about him. In Romans 2, in verse 4, we find these words or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience oh my it's very easy to think lightly of God's grace is it not to take God's great his amazing grace lightly do you see God has poured out his riches upon us God has given us his kindness God has been tolerant with you hasn't he and me <laughs> yeah I think so I think so God paid an incredible price for my salvation. And the gift of God is eternal life. I didn't earn it. I didn't pay for it. I just received it. But that means I have an obligation, though. I have an obligation to be thankful. I have an obligation to be grateful. I have an obligation to be faithful to my God for what he has done for me. Look at this one in Romans chapter 1. The Apostle Paul said, I am under obligation. Do you see those words? Paul felt the obligation. In one translation, it's translated, uh, I owe a debt. I owe a debt. We see in Matthew 10, our Lord said, freely you have received, freely give. When I was a little boy, I rode to church in a car I never paid for. I never paid the payments on the car. I never paid for the gas. I sat in a Sunday school class. I never paid for that building. I never paid for the heat. They, they gave us a quarterly. In our church, you had a Bible and a quarterly. We called it a quarterly because you got a new one every quarter of a year. 
It came from headquarters. The Bible came from heaven and the quarterly came from headquarters and they were on the same level. <laughs> I never paid for the quarterly. Somebody else paid all that for me. Somebody said, you know, you, you pay for your raising when you raise your kids. <laughs> I owe a debt. I owe an obligation. Sunday after Sunday, as we did this morning, we meet in my office with prayer partners who come in and pray. And then when we, when we leave my office, we walk down all these hallways, making our way over here. But when you walk by the royal room, I walk by a picture of some people I know real well. <laughs> my mother and dad. And Sunday after Sunday, I walk by and I look at that picture and I say, I'm going to go do what I know you want me to do. I'm going to share your book. I'm going to share God's book, the book you used to change my life. I'm going to share that with people. Thanks, Mom and Dad. So I owe an ob obligation, don't you? You know, a mom and dad who loved and prayed and cared and and took me to church and didn't charge me for the gas. <laughs> I owe them an obligation. Listen, we all owe an ob obligation to those who've gone before us. Yes, we do. I think about people who died in the war. So you might be free here this morning. You owe an obligation, my friend. There's some other, not only those who've gone before us, but you know what? We owe an obligation to those that are downstairs right now, the little kids. They're coming after us. We owe them an obligation. Do you know that? We don't go downstairs and say, all right, you kids, pay for the heat. <laughs> no, we don't. No, we don't. We just love them, and we pray for them, and we give for their sake. This man had no sense of obligation number four he had no confidence in God I don't see a confidence of God in this man no wonder Jesus called him a fool he was a practical atheist uh, is your confidence in what you have or in what God can provide This man's confidence was in what he had, not in what God could provide. On our coins, it says, in God we trust. Do we really? You know, it's one thing to believe in God. It's another thing to believe God. And a lot of Christians believe in God. A lot of people believe in God, but they don't really believe God. It's very easy to substitute God with our gold and put our trust in our possessions rather than in God. This man was mortal, but he was also immortal, and so are you. There's a part of you are made in the likeness of God, according to the scripture. There's a part of you that'll be around a thousand years from now. And this man made no provision for eternity. He made the same provision for eternity that he'd make for his donkey or his oxen. None. In God we trust. Can you imagine if the Christians of America would just believe God? Believe God's promises? I mean, you know, just trust God. I mean, really live by faith. Really believe God. What, what are you doing for God that if God doesn't come through, you're in trouble? The just shall not only get saved by faith, but the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Do you know the Bible says that four times? The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. One more. The just shall live by faith. <laughs> Boy, when God says something four times, it's pretty important. God wants your life to be a life of believing, not just in him, but believing him. 
Can you imagine in America if all God's people who really knew him would believe him? You know? I mean, he said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. See if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. God would begin to bless churches in America and transform churches, and there would be such an excitement in the air. And nobody would say, church is boring. People would be so excited. Wow. But God said to him, you fool. You fool. Um, You fool. And then God said, this very night your soul is required. And now who will own what you have prepared? Now that's what God said to him. But listen to this. If we go from verse 20 to verse 21, he said, you fool. And if we go dot, 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 and then pick up verse 21 where he talks to us. So is the man. So is the man what? He's a fool. You fool. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. God said, if I live for myself and not for him, I'm a fool. Am I rich towards God? You know what? You can live your life for yourself. And you will be able to, at the end of life, say, I exceeded, I I erred exceedingly. I have played the fool. Or you can be wise. You know, we've been trying to get guys to read through Proverbs, not just guys, but all of you, ladies and people to read through Proverbs. We've got a Project 31 deal going on, and people are reading through Proverbs. Why? Because it's the book of wisdom. It is the book of wisdom in the Bible, and we need wisdom. Um, And it says a lot about wisdom in Proverbs. Oh, an awful lot about wisdom. But one thing it says in Proverbs 11, it says, He who is wise wins souls. He wins souls. In other words, he puts his life into helping people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. For as he thinks in his heart, why did Jesus call this man a fool? Well, He let us hear his thinking. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. You know what? The key is the heart. The key is my heart. The key is your heart. Is my heart all about me? Or is it about God? There's only one thing can change your heart, and that's the Spirit of God doing a work of grace. That's it. Last week I told you about visiting Pastor Scott's mother in the hospital, Jane Wiles, and when I went up to her bedside, She said to me, I have no fear. And then she proceeded to tell me why. She said, uh, when I was in third grade, my grandmother led me to Jesus. (laughs) Well, on Friday, we went to the service. Our whole staff went to the service in uh, Seward. And... uh, They sang some wonderful old hymns of the faith that we used to sing when we were kids. You know, victory in Jesus, in the garden. And and the pastor shared about, uh, he said, I got a letter from a missionary. If I could understand it right, I was just like some of you sitting in the back. You know, just, I got the prime seats. Steve and I did in the back. And, uh, and, uh. He said, a missionary in Africa said, I I still consider your church our home church because my wife uh, was led to Jesus by Jane Wiles when she was in a class in Bible school there. And uh, wow, That's, that's real wisdom, isn't it, you know? 
And I thought about what a great reward that she has in glory. And uh, Nick sang, I'll fly away. Nick, come up here. I want you to sing it. He's going to sing it in a minute. I asked him if he'd sing it for us today. And I, at the time, when I asked him, I had no idea. I also had this to share with you. I was on my way home yesterday from the Mopac Trail. Uh, froze out there running. Man, it was cold. I got started too late and then got back and it was dark. And I'm riding home and I got this message in the car that uh, Don was, Drevo was at St. E's very seriously ill, and so I whipped the car around, went back, and um, visited with Don in the ER, and um, I told him, now, don't you, go be going, don't you be going to heaven before me, bud. His birthday was last week. I called him and reminded him that he was older than dirt, and <laughs> and we got the call early this morning, and Don's home with Jesus. And uh, he's like another dad to me, you know. He's been such a part of this church for so many years, since we were over in the, in the Belmont Community Center when we met in the rented building. Don came, Don and Maxine. And by the way, Maxine's here this morning. Would you stand, Maxine? Let's give her a hand. Give her a hand. There she is. Bless her heart. Um, you know, the, the doctor was asking her questions. We were outside the room, and he was asking her about Don's medications and things, and he said, uh, does Don uh, drink alcohol? And she said, well, he was a heavy drinker until 35 years ago. <laughs> and uh, somebody handed me uh, a card when we were meeting over in the Belmont Center, had their names on it, Don and Maxine Drevo. I didn't know who they were, didn't. But in those days, we visited in people's homes. Relax, we're not going to do that now, unless you want us to, unless you ask us to. But we went to their, I went by their house, and, uh, and I shared with Don and Maxine, you know, Jesus died for our sins, and we're sinners, and and there's a penalty on sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died for us. And through Jesus, we can have the gift of eternal life. And they both asked Jesus to come into their heart that day. And uh, ever since then, been as faithful as clockwork. I mean, Don was faithful to the very end. I mean, we had a prayer partner fellowship, and he was there the other night. I sat by him at the table, you know. And uh, somebody had to keep him in line. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, Don was in charge of one of the weeks of our prayer team. And he would call everybody to come and remind them to come and pray with me on Sunday morning. His week always had the best turnout because he would tell them, Look, if you don't get there and pray, we're going to have to listen to a lousy sermon from Pastor Carl. We need to pray for him. <laughs> Thank God. I am so thankful that God gave us Drevo. Man, what a great man. What a great work. And uh, <laughs> you know what Maxine said to me last night? She said, you know that pickup we had for so long? She said, Don never wanted to get rid of it because it was the first vehicle he never wrecked. Because <laughs> he was sober. And Don loved to read his Bible. He was always reading his Bible. He'd always tell me where he was reading in his Bible. And uh, he liked that and watching old westerns on television. Between those two things, you know. <laughs> Don't know what that had to do with it. But uh, we've been blessed. We've been blessed. I just want you to listen to, to Nick sing, I'll Fly Away. And just remember, you and I are not going to be here forever, okay? So I'm glad morning when this life is o'er. Hello. 
celestial shore I'll fly away I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away When I die Hallelujah by and by I'll fly away When the shadows of this life have gone has flown, I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, just a few more weary days and then, joy shall never end, I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Good job, buddy. Awesome. What a great message and song. Two things Jesus was telling us. Make your life count. Be rich towards God. Don't just live for yourself. Secondly, 30-some years ago, in their living room, Don and Maxine bowed and invited Jesus to be their Savior. My question to you is, have you done that? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? None of us has any assurance that we have tomorrow. This man said, I've laid up goods for many years, and the Lord said, tonight your soul will be required. We don't know. We need to be ready. We're all just a heartbeat away from eternity. Heavenly Father, Help us now that we would be ready. May everyone here know you. May we all be rich towards you and be wise. So you don't have to say to us, you fool. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, you join me in this prayer in your heart where you sit. Would you talk to God? He loves you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much. Thank you for blessing us, Lord, in so many ways. So many benefits, as we say with the psalmist, you have blessed us in so many ways. Thank you for giving to this church, Don Drivo. Thank you, God, for that gift. We will be grateful. Thank you for your promise. Your promise that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we know where he is and we rejoice and we thank you. Thank you, dear God. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord in our tithes and offerings right now. What a wonderful opportunity to worship the Lord in our tithes and offerings.